we are going to discuss something that's been bugging the crap out of me for quite a long time. And it comes down to this. I want to know what if Elid Kachoki was paid to attempt the marathon record barefoot. And uh, yeah, so, you know, obviously my thought process is this. Um, Nike throws a buttload of money at this guy to wear their shoe. And in so doing, setting a world record, the world is taken by storm. Now everybody wants to buy that shoe or some similar uh, inclination of that shoe from Nike. So it's money well spent by Nike. And I have to tell you, Blue, I'm not sure we're going to discuss it. But I think, honestly, if you just let the guy run, as a matter of fact, if you put the money out there, you say, look, we're going to pay you, I don't know what he gets paid by Nike. Let's just say it's a million bucks. We're going to pay you a million bucks just to set the record, and we want you to do it barefoot. Do you think he'd take that bet? Ooh, that's a hot topic. <laughs> Man, I, it's like if you could train for it and get his feet able to deal with the, the pavement, like I, why wouldn't he? Yeah, I mean, I, I like, I can't wait to get more into this because the reasons would be why and and how. But it's it's sort of like Bakele winning the gold medal barefoot back in what was it '64, uh, I think it was. Yeah. And then he came back with the gold medal the next Olympics with shoes on, but the times weren't that different, which is interesting. No. no. You know? Well, so uh, here's the thing. Now people are sitting in their cushy little homes with their puffy little feet. They're thinking there's no way. He takes his shoes off, he's screwed, right? But they're not taking into context the fact that the guy was raised in Kenya. And, you know, he ran to school. And I looked it up. I wanted to know. It's two miles to school each way he ran to school. And I can't, I wasn't there. But I want to bet you money when he was a kid, it was barefoot. And, you know, when you grow up this way, when you, when you live the life of, you know, a barefoot person, and it's not a big stretch for you to run across. I have. I, I used to make jokes about the, the my neighbor kid across the street from me. I don't know how old he is. Must have been four years old, something like that. He's rip. I mean, you got a couple of kids. You know this. He's ripping yeah. across the street through pavement, sidewalk. Doesn't think about it at all. Barefoot. Never. A, never a care in the world. You know, he's not like, oh, well, I want. Wait a minute. I should be putting my shoes on before I try this. <laughs> it's not like that at all. You know, he's just running. And by the way, with perfect mechanics, absolutely yeah. impeccable mechanics, because nobody screwed them up, right? Yeah. And so let's take it from that perspective. Let's say that you grew up up and down the mountains on trail primarily because that's probably where you live, uh, uh, unincorporated un, uh, areas where there's not a lot of paved roads, and if they are, they're kind of beat up anyway, and you're barefoot. And so putting on... A shoe, mind you, a shoe that's got a lot of stack height, a lot of cushion, and all these manifestations they create to try to improve your running mechanics, try to improve on what God made you, and and then uh, you know, and then try to take over. It. I just don't think it's it's a comfortable proposition. Um, so I I would I'd be willing to bet. I don't know that I'm going to throw a lot of money at it, but I, I'd be willing to bet that if they put the money out there, I, I mean, today, let's just say today, they say, you know what, we're just curious to know, if you didn't wear those stupid shoes and we just let you run barefoot for a marathon, what would it look like? And I bet you'd yeah. take that bet all day long. And I bet you that if, if let's, let's say he didn't break two hours, I bet he'd pre be pretty damn close, right? And I bet if you took... And you just put regular old school racing flats on them with no technology, just a little piece of rubber. You know, I think that that like I guarantee, with it, just watching the human progression of marathon and all race times get faster and faster and faster, that that progression is happening anyway. And then the shoes are taking all the credit for it when the athletes are just they're putting more, they're they're making more sacrifices. Everything in sport is getting taken to a higher level. And it's just so funny to watch the marketing behind this whole thing. I'm like, and the shoes take all the credit. It's like, That's, yes. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And, and listen, 
you and I, um, you know, we've known each other quite a long time. And I, I'm not I'm not here pounding the drum for barefoot running. I'm just suggesting that the influences that are that are imposed upon you by a shoe do not have not nobody's proven so far that by the little gimmicks that they throw into these shoes, you're going to become a faster runner. And there's a lot of people that want to yeah. believe it. And I've been hearing a lot of people talking about the, the, the carbon fiber shank that they're putting in the shoe now, and they're getting some, some yeah. bounce out of this thing. Um, and, uh, you know, years ago, I mean, when we were doing things with Newton, they, they used to, you know, I, I have a cutaway of one of their shoes cause I used to sell them in my place. Had a little carbon, um, plate in there under the yep. forefoot right <clears throat> and uh yep. th their their interest was to cause the surface that you come down on to be firmer they weren't looking yeah. for any kind of response from it other than to basically become a firmer right. surface right. um and, yep. th th and i think the 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 the, f the falsehood in all of that is that you've got this little wafer of carbon but beneath that you got those lugs and that's soft. That's supposed to kind of like let you know that you're landing in the right spot. And then so all that that fluffy stuff between you and the ground is where problems start to, to arise. And yeah. and I, I'm never going to get a shoe sponsor ever unless somebody one day gets ballsy enough to create the right kind of shoe and never decides to change it. You know, the biggest frustrations yeah. people have with, with shoe manufacturers is as soon as they settle into something they like, they change it, right? Yeah. And that the closest thing Nike ever came to having a decent shoe or shoe line was the Nike Free, which they've canceled. Right. But that shoe allowed your foot to go through natural range of motion. It wasn't giving you much more than a little padding. Um, it had that pattern on the bottom that would, the, the, sole itself, the sole itself was cut up so that it would flex, you know, in every direction. So the shoe was really just doing nothing more than patting the foot. Um, but, you know, of course, that's that's gone. Well, yeah. And the only thing the only thing um, that I would take exception. Well, a couple things that would take exception to in that particular shoe was they came to that little point in the front, like all the rest of the shoes do. Yeah. And I've, I've been arguing this point for a long time where, you know, your your big toe. It's out here, man. It's not up here in the yeah. middle. It's not there. So if you're kind of controlling the design of the shoe, you should try to conform the shoe to your foot, not try to yeah. get your foot to conform to the shoe, which yes. is a problem. And, and big toe strength and activation and tibialis activation helps dorsiflexion, hamstring activation, all the way up to kinetic chain. So, I mean, having a strong big toe and the ability to flex that, it's huge for for the way everything, the entire range of motion happens. And I mean, well, not only that, but it, 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 take it a step further. You're referring to the windlass mechanism, which is basically where when you flex that great toe, you you uh, you tension your plantar fascia, which supports yeah. your midfoot and obla di obla da right up the kinetic chain. You're starting to improve your your mechanics. You're you're more stable. You have more force production off the ground. But so, and then. If you, if you take a little too much squishy material between you and the ground, all bets are off again. Because that, that influence of, of you trying to identify where the ground is um, through that material is a problem. So I, I've told people a million times, said, look, I'm not going to tell you what shoe to buy. I want it to be, I don't want it to influence you. I don't want the shoe to be designed in such a way that uh, it cramps your toes or it tries to teach you to do something. I don't want any, any um, um, I forgot what they call it, um, where they're putting stuff under the arch. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. They're, they're yeah. La they put that, that, that last, um, a stiff last underneath there that try to hold your arch up. You know, whenever you try to get in the way of what the muscles are trying to do, you, you, you make the muscles weaker. Right. Yeah. So I, I just, I don't know. And, and so, the potpourri of stuff that's gone into the shoe that Kipchoge wore uh, during that during that uh, amazing achievement. Um, I don't know. I I I I'd venture to say that if they just let him run with a shoe that really works for him, rather than a shoe that that really works for them, <laughs> he 
he probably would have even got faster. He probably would have even got faster. Well, can we talk about what they're trying to achieve from the shoe? I think, like from my understanding, the idea of a soft cushion is the mitigation of impact forces, right? So you're trying to like, you're trying to like allow for less damage to the body. That's what I've heard so many times from from Nike and other companies that are that are trying to innovate this whole thing. And then they're giving the the force that you're lo- that you lose by mitigating the impact you've got to replace it with something. So that carbon fiber plate basically is like an energy return system. So you're basically losing force production with a soft foam and you're giving it back with the carbon fiber plate. So you're basically trading force, right? Like you're losing it and then you're giving it back. What's the point of the whole thing? It's like- Well, it, but first of all, it, it's, it's, it's not true, okay? By putting that cushion between you and the ground, you're not mitigating impact forces. I'm sitting here looking at the research study that we just discussed a few moments ago where they compared barefoot runners to shod runners that had cushioned soles and the impact forces were were really no different. It's just that because the barefoot runners are more in tune, their their afferent feedback they're grabbing from the ground causes you to be sharper. You're you're proactive to the next step rather than being reactive. So when you land on that cushion, you're, you're getting a false uh, positive from the ground. You're not really feeling what the ground's doing until late. And then the reaction of the stiffening of the leg is also late. And so it's, and I use, I've used this analogy a million times. It's like, if I go to punch you in the face and then you duck <laughs> after I punched you, right? You know, that's, that's what you're doing. You, you're, you're responding, but you're late where when you, when you're sharp, when you're having this impact force translate from your central nervous system back into your feet and everything up the kinetic chain in a proactive stance, you're going to be a lot, lot more capable of dealing with that impact force. And so it's not true. It just is not true. I mean, I've seen, I've seen so many different studies where they've measured the force plate uh, measurements with what's the guys, uh, Daniel Lieberman back in the day, uh, right there yeah. in, you know, the, the, the gospel book written by yeah. Chris McDougall, yeah. Uh, Daniel Lieberman showed force plate uh, measurements on shod and unshod runners, and the impact forces clearly were greater in the shod runners than they were in the in the uh, barefoot runners. And again, so I, I, I'm not I'm not trying to sell barefoot running. I'm going to say it again, but I, I just don't want to see someone try to take people down Primrose Lane with all this gadgetry in the shoe. And, and lead them to believe that they're going to be in a better place for having purchased those shoes. And, and at so, the price huh? <laughs> at the cost are insane as well. It's just, well, no, so, so yes, but so look at, look at the, you know, the, the way this all came about, right? Chris McDougall writes a book on born to run. Everybody goes out and buys those five finger shoes, right? Or boat slippers or whatever they're called. So, now they're all drinking the Kool-Aid. They're, they're trying to be a Tar Mahara Indian. You know, they're trying to find it, sandals, the whole thing, right? And they're, oh, yeah, this makes perfect sense to me. And so everybody went down that road, right? And then all the shoe manufacturers started getting into more minimal design. New Balance came up with a more minimal design. Nike was, trying, like you're talking about the Nike Free. They kind of tiptoed into it, but never really committed themselves to it. Yep. And, you know, all the other brands, they all kind of got into that minimal design. And then Hoka came along with the stack height. They said, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, you can't be in that angle because that angle causes your center of mass to be in front of you or your center of balance is to be in front of you. So it encourages heel striking or overstriding. We don't want to do that. Blah, 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 blah. So they say, oh, we're going to get zero drop. So now everybody's on this rant about a zero drop and they go, well, everybody's doing zero drop. What's our marketing position? We're just going to put it off the ground a little higher. So you got zero <laughs> drop. You got zero drop and a whole bunch of cushion between you and the ground. And, yeah. you know, and I'm sure everybody looked at it going, wait a minute, that's kind of stupid. You know, that we're trying to get closer to the ground. But yeah. then the sales started going, going whack because, you know, it was a, it was a novel idea. Oh yeah. Well, I'm in zero drop. So my balance point is going to be better, but um, it hurts, you know, when I try to land that way. So I need the cushion, right? I need the Cadillac between me and the ground. So Hoka started killing it. And then, I mean, I know this to be true because I, 
I was a dealer for some of these companies, and I'm not going to use the brand names too too quickly. I don't think I'm, I'm probably going to dump it pretty soon. <laughs> but uh, then I've seen these brands that I mean to tell you, oh okay, screw it, Ultra, <laughs> Ultra. There it is. Listen, Ultra when they came out, when they came out of the box, the very first shoe they made, I thought, man, that thing looks like something Elmer Fudd might wear, right? Yeah. It was the ugliest thing. I said, I don't even, I'm, I mean, I sold them. And I was thinking, I don't know. I just, this whole thing looks so weird. Because yeah. it was the first shoe that really, you know, got on top of that broad toe box, right? And yeah. the, the, the sole was firm. So you had good protection. But the zero, uh, zero drop. So there was, there was no, no lift in the heel. And it, it was golden. I mean, the, the first shoe they made was the best shoe they made. And then their company started doing really well with that because that was kind of the new thing, you know, a broad toe box, zero drop. Everybody was like, they were they were ticking the boxes, right? Yeah. And then somewhere along the way, I, I have to believe that somebody that is vested in, you know, the board of directors invested in the company started looking at the numbers that Hoka was putting up. They said, we need to do something. So they start going in that, that battlefield where they start raising... Mm -hmm. The, the shoe further and further and further off the ground. Yep. And you know what? I said, screw it. I can't do business with these people anymore. I can't buy that shoe, right? They still kept a couple. They still kept a couple. To this day, they still have a couple that I could still live with. Yeah. But they have a lot of them in there that will confuse people. Yeah. So I went to Topo Athletic. Topo Athletic, their design was all, I mean, there should have been some patent infringements on the, on the design because it was identical in design to what uh, Ultra was doing in the very early days. Guess what? They're doing it too. Now they got the big fuddy-duddy shoe with the, I'm like, come on, man, you're driving me crazy. And so here's what happens. Here's what happens. I see people on a regular, you know this, I, you do too. I see people on a regular basis that come to me for advice on how to run. And most of them are coming not for performance reasons, but because they're injured. They've got, yeah. you know, something, there's this nagging injury. Every time I get past 20 miles, my shins go off, my knee goes off, my IT band, plantar fasciitis, Achilles tendonitis. You just, a garden variety of injuries that go off because they're just running badly, right? Yeah. And so somebody, their buddy, tells them, hey, look, wear these puffy shoes. They're going to help you. They don't, um, but they're, they're desperate. They're trying anything. And, um, but they come and see me, and I explain to them what we just discussed. I said, look, you need to get closer to the ground. You need to have protection, but you don't want the shoe to get in your way. You want your foot to do what it's designed to do because it's smarter than the shoe manufacturers are, right? Yeah. And just let your foot do what it does. And you know yeah. this too. I mean, I'm going to get ahead of myself and assume you get somebody out on an infield of a football field that's like a, a um, astroturf or something where it's really pristine, and you take their shoes off, they run perfectly. Mm. You almost don't have to tell them anything, yeah. right? Yeah. Because the feedback they're getting from their feet is putting them exactly where they're not running on their heels anymore, right? Yeah. Um, so I just want to get them closer. And so they're like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, I mean, they might go as far as the first pair of shoes they buy is something that I might have recommended to them. And here's where the here's where I really get screwed. It's like, then I'll see something on social media like six months later, eight months later, and they're wearing one of those idiotic shoes again. The marketing the marketing genius finally got to them. The, you know, like it's yeah. like it's like it's insidious. It's like eating at you. You know, eating at yeah. you. And the, what if? works let me try it I, I, i'm guilty i've done it i've like i've experienced it i know yeah i can't do it man i can't well i take it back i did once i did once and this is a long time ago and i have a friend who remains nameless that is he's he works for hoka and he's in the design field he's 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 into the whole design thing he calls me up and says dude you got he goes i know i know i know i know how you are and whatever but I got this shoe. I want you to try it. I'm going to send you a pair. It was one of the first iterations of the Hoka bastard shoe. I don't remember the yeah. name. And I thought, well, okay, you know, he's a good guy. I'm going to, I'll give it a shot. He, gave, he sent me the shoe, right? I went outside. I got a half a block. 
And I, I was scared. I, I mean to tell you that I was so unsure of what I was doing that it scared me. Yeah. I turned yeah. I turned right around, went home, put them back in the box, told my wife to sell them. And she, she put them on eBay or something and we got rid of them. $500. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. But yeah. so... Um, Again, getting back to the argument, the argument is, what if, what if somebody threw some money at Kipchoge and said, hey, look, we happen to believe that it is not the shoe that you're, that is leading you to success. We believe that if you're just left to your own devices, if you just take, take whatever time you need to train for it, like you did for Nike, matter of fact, go all the rest of the stuff they did for him you know, getting his nutrition organized and all the testing and diet and whatever, uh, hydration strategies and all that. Keep all that. You know, that's all good stuff. Keep yeah. all that. Just take the freaking shoes off. And same yeah. drill. Find your pristine environment to run in. I mean, they find they find the most premium place to do this, right? Yep. And same, same course. Try it again barefoot. I mean, even for me, it's like, even without just the high tech, you know, elevator shoes, whatever those are, the, the space walkers. I mean, even just some old racing flats is, is it would be an, as interesting. I mean, well, not quite as interesting because the, the only thing for me would be like, is the bottom of his foot, would it, would he be able to build the calluses enough up in X amount of time? I mean, he have to take like, I feel like it would take like a, a year to really get a proper callousing back on his foot after but being. See, I don't know, man. I mean, you and I both, you know, our dear friend who's passed away, Alberto, who what, he had the world Alberto. record for the most, the most barefoot runs of any human being, the Guinness Book of World Record, right? Yep. Now, his feet weren't real pretty, but they weren't scarred up either. I mean, it was, and oh, yeah. what was that other dude's name that used to be, was Ted somebody? Who was the guy? Todd huh? Byers. Todd Byers. The guy that came out, he came out to one of our clinics and, and you know, I was really curious to look at this, his feet. Right. And, and his feet look, look perfect. I mean, they didn't look any different than mine. And yeah. I don't know how many bar marathons he had run at that point in time, barefoot, on pavement. Yeah. Um, There's a, a famous barefoot runner, Barefoot Julian, I believe his name is. I was running San Francisco Marathon relatively fast, probably in the top 20 crossing the bridge around the halfway point, And I catch up to this guy wearing short shorts and nothing else. Huge curly hair, just flying young guy in his twenties. And I come up next to him and I'm like, man, you're freaking crazy. And he goes, you're freaking crazy. And this guy was like a 240 marathoner and he could knock off 240 marathons on the road on challenging courses any day of the week. Built like a, just a, a Scottish warrior. Um, but yeah, it was, it was funny. Cause he's like, yeah, you're crazy. And I'm like, was, was he barefoot? I, Barefoot, yeah. Barefoot 240 guy, like all day, every day. I mean, that was his thing. Um, well, I don't believe, right. yeah, I don't believe it's a function of needing callus. Calluses are going to save you if friction is involved in your ground contact. Right. So when you start scuffing the ground, you got a problem, right? And then you probably build calluses to try to abate those that friction. Yeah. Um, but when you land well, you don't have that friction. Yeah. So, and I think that when you're more sensitive to the way you're landing, you're more, you're more inclined to do the right things and not need it. I, I, I would venture to say that they probably don't need, I mean, it's not like if you go check all these barefoot runners in Africa, you're going to find all these big calluses on their feet. I don't think that's the case at all. Yeah. I mean, I, I one of my friends, Prince Mumba, two-time Olympian, the 800 meters, he sent shoes back to Africa, back to Zambia, where he's from. And in Lusaka, they don't have any shoes that, you know, they're, they're, they, they don't have much at all. And it's funny to watch. He'll send me videos when he brings the shoes back. These kids are sprinting on the track, on the track surface. It's with, it was pretty rough. And I mean, they're doing like, you know, they're doing fast workouts. And some will have like Crocs on their feet that don't fit. Some, most of them are barefoot. And it's interesting because it's not as if the guys winning in, in the workouts or the races are the ones with shoes on. Not at all. Right? Like the barefoot guys, there's more barefoot than, than, than shod. And it, yeah, it's not, the shoes are definitely not the, the, um, I guess that, yeah, it just shows that it's, it's, an, it's equal either way. Basically. Well, I, I'm with you. Uh, the racing flat would be a good design. And, and, you know, it's funny cause I used to, I, you know, I'm a geek. I used to go to these high school, 
um, track meets. And I see these kids that are wearing these fancy uh, spikes that they're, you know, I'm sure that like Billy got a pair of these really bitchin' spikes. So everybody's got to have that, that particular spike, you know, whatever it costs, parents just do it. Right. And they're not even yep. running with, with uh, the spikes. They're landing on their heels on, on the track. And I'm sitting there going, hello, do you notice or, those things in the front? That's for you to, you know, and yeah. you know, the coach is standing there watching. He's not saying a word about it, but uh, he has no idea. Right. Yeah. So, but the point is, is that, um, they would run uh, when they're competing, they put on the, the track spikes or the racing flats. And then when they go out on the road yeah. and train, the, the shoe is polar opposite, some big heel, whatever. And it, it's contrary because now you're confusing your feet. Your feet don't even, yeah. you know, one day it does this and one day you're asking it to do something else and, and it doesn't, it doesn't bode well. Uh, I've yeah. told people a million times, said, look, whatever you design, whatever design shoe you end up with, Try to be consistent with it, no matter what you do. You know, I'm going to go to a race this weekend, uh, uh, the Nashville Spartan. Uh, I hadn't been there yet. This is the first time for me since I moved. And I know what's going to happen. All, all the people that are racing are going to wear a trail shoe that the majority of them are going to wear a trail shoe that are zero drop and very minimal in design. Um, yep. And then when they train, they're wearing something completely different. They put on some big mokin, you know, put puffy shoe and they get out there and, you know, swing for the fences. Right. Yeah. And uh, so and, and, you know, they could be heel striking. They could be running okay. around in their cushy shoes on their heels. And then when they change to the minimal shoe, yeah. they do the same thing. And then they don't know why they're getting hurt. Yeah. You know, they think it's well as a shoe. I got to keep wearing the other puffy shoe. That's, you know, so. Yeah. Anyway, I this is this this is like therapy for me, right? Uh, get getting a chance <laughs> to actually rant. You're gonna get about, you know about this because I honestly, I, if there's anybody out there that's watching this right now, I'm dying to hear what they're thinking about whether or not they think that the forget about Kachoga. Let's just talk about across the board these African runners. You know, you know what happens. Tell me, tell me one guy that you know. That's a sub two fifteen marathoner that doesn't have a shoe sponsor. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, watching like um, Scott Fobbs and these guys and Flagstaff and you know so the up and coming generations. Um, it's a lot of them don't have a shoe sponsor in the beginning, and they achieve that level without the sponsor running whatever the hell that they get their hands on for whatever reason. Um, and then they get the shoe sponsor and then it's funny because it's not as if they just make fancy shoe and then they start running that much better. It just doesn't happen. You know, no, you're, but not, my, you're not seeing. Yeah. Them. My point being is that when you start looking at the elite fields, these guys have shoe sponsors, right? Because the, yeah. the, the manufacturers are trying to get their brand out there in, in the populace on somebody that shines. Right. Yeah. And, and so if, if I approach you, you know, you worked for Nike for so many years if I approached yep. you and I said, look, um, we think you're a great athlete and we think you're going to do great things and we're going to support you and we're going to give you, you know, let's just say we're going to give you five grand a month and this is the shoe we want you to wear and we're going to give you a bonus every time you win a race. You're wearing that yep. freaking shoe, right? Because you're thinking, come hell or high water, I want that five grand and I could probably still run pretty well in it, you know? Yeah. It might even hurt your feet. But you'll you'll wear it, you'll wear it. Remember Meb getting dropped by Nike because he wasn't performing for a couple of years. Wins Boston, I think it wasn't even wearing Skechers. Remember the Skechers? Yeah. I mean, it's it just goes to show. Like, I mean, that shoe there wasn't much to it. That was it was a very simple. I mean, they were not putting a lot of. They didn't have a lot of money to throw at those shoes, you know. One Boston. No, but I, again, it's it's just people come. They're under the impression that oh my God, look at he's wearing and. And, you know, by the way, in, in obstacle course racing, there's a new shoe brand. It's called VJ Shoes, right? VJ Shoes, right? And guess who they called first for a sponsorship deal? Yeah. VJ, right? <laughs> VJ was an up and coming guy. He was winning, you know, shoe in for world championships. First call they made. And, you know, to his credit, the shoe was too narrow for him. He said, I can't, I can't do business with you. I can't wear the shoe. 
because right. I will not win if I wear that shoe, right? Yeah. Um, so what they did is they gave a pair of those shoes to everybody else. Everybody else that's top flight athlete in the sport got a pair of VJs. And guess yeah. what? Everybody that saw the pros are wearing the VJs, everybody went out and bought a pair of VJs, right? Wow. I've never Marketing. put a pair on. I have no idea whether they're good or bad or indifferent. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to cast dispersion without having experienced it. Um, but just looking at the shoe, uh, it, it hasn't drawn my attention for, for all the great, you know, virtue that it, it presents. It just, just ain't that big of a deal. Um, yeah. It's actually pretty benign. It's, it reminds me of like, uh, like an old uh, Nike Air or something, you know, without the sack, it's just, you know, a little bit, of, I think it's got like a four mil drop or something like that, you know, a little bit of uh, stack height and the toe box now is starting to get a little bit broader. I think they're kind of getting a, an inkling as to the, the need for that, but it's not that big a deal, you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I just, I just think that, the influence that's imposed on these athletes and the influence from the athletes that's imposed on the populace is just corrupt. And I agree. And I, I, my personal experience in around 70 marathons and going from like just your everyday running shoe, not knowing any better up to like racing flats and then watching this whole going through the minimalist era and, and doing stuff we did together with Newton um, and ultra just, I feel like I've seen it from so many different angles. And my personal PR was wearing the one of the most minimal shoes that I've ever seen, which was the, the, the it was like a waffle racer of Nikes, which was the Flyknit racer, which they basically were, they had that, that knit technology where they had like a single piece of string knit together. But the sole was like, it was just this minimal sole. I remember nothing it, yeah. to. And they're supposed to just be sort of a fashion play for them. I did every one of my training runs every one of my races over like a five or six year period in that shoe. And I was never faster and my feet were super strong. Um, and I have since run multiple marathons with the high stack height carbon fiber plate did not get faster. And I've been really fit going into those races as well. And I, in my last race, I wasn't training in the Nike, um, at all I was wearing Adidas. Um, but I, the shoe I was wearing with Adidas turned out to be illegal. Um, so I switched to the Nike, last minute and i every step i took in the alpha fly it felt i could i could, was consciously aware of the loss of force every step like that that padding that squishiness it was not it didn't feel like it, a it didn't feel natural like we're talking about but it, it, it felt like i was taking away my power um and i just didn't feel like that the plate was giving the power back and so it just felt squishy it felt like felt it just didn't feel good you know and i and i would i would never race in that shoe again um, but it's definitely not the popular opinion right now. So it yeah. is interesting how many people like jump on the bandwagon because that's <clears throat> what everyone's doing. If you look at the elite field, they're all wearing these squishy shoes. And when you watch people standing in these shoes, oh my god, you're they're wrong. You're all they're, you're all over the place. Like you can't stand well, still. Well, so, so the other thing, to... yeah. So the other thing that happens, let's say there's a corruption in the way you do move. Uh, let's just say, uh, just for sake of argument, that you're. You're, you're, you're landing on the outside edge of your heel. A lot of guys do that, right? And you start to yeah. saw that off, right? So you start to cut away at that soft material there. And then it's, it's the problem is now exacerbated, right? Yeah. So you have yeah. this, it, it results in late stage pronation. You start to go way out to the outside, then you dump in as you start to pass over your foot. And now you're really digging a hole, right? I've seen, I don't know how mm -hmm. many people wearing hokas running down a trail, and me being behind them and see all the wobble going on, uh, the pronation, supination, knees dumping in, because they're just completely yep. unstable, you know? Yep. And so the other thing is, too, and, you know, the difference between being in a flat versus something like that is the the level of feedback you're getting from the ground. It, it, if, if you have protection, you feel confident, you'll do, you'll take chances, right? And so in a shoe that provides you stability, provides you with uh, support. I want to say support, meaning that if you hit a rock or something like that, you're okay. Um, yeah. But the polar opposite direction is when you're relying all on this, you're all over the place. You don't even know what your foot's doing, right? And, you know, it brings me to this, this study again. We didn't talk about this very much, but I'm looking at this study, and just, just to let people know what I'm talking about, uh, this was a study I pulled up. It was in my archive. 
and I found it the other day and I thought I gotta bring this out. It was a Journal of Sport and Health at the University of Virginia. They did a survey and it was they referred to it as evidence from the field. So they talked to 509 people that were experiencing barefoot running, all right? And I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but the, the highlights of this research showed that um, the majority of the runners that were running barefoot, um, that were running barefoot because they were experiencing injuries, those problems went away. I'm sorry, 69%. The previous injuries they were experiencing before running barefoot went away. And they also did a, a, a measurement of the impact forces between someone wearing a cushion shoe and being barefoot. And there, there's no difference in the impact force. And it doesn't matter what surface you run on. Some people, we talked about this briefly, yeah, they're under the opinion that uh, running on pavement or concrete is bad for them. That hard surface is a problem for them. So they need to run on trails. Your body adapts. You get an adaptation to that 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 uh, that surface, and you basically your body tunes to that surface. And uh, I had conversations, many conversations, incidentally, with Dr. Emily Spiegel years ago about uh, this this uh, um, preparation into a run. She'll she'll have people take their shoes off and move around on the surface they're going to run on barefoot then put their shoes back on like the tuning their feet to the surface. Yeah. So, so the idea being to be preemptive or preactive in their activity. And I thought, yep. how does that work? How can you, how can you be preactive or proactive? And the thing that kind of finally stuck with me was, and I know you've done this before. So if you're trying to teach somebody a box jump, right? And let's say that we're taking it to a challenging level now. We're, we're going to do a 36-inch box jump, right? And you're standing in front of that box, and you're looking at it, and you're like trying to you're trying to get off the ground. You feel, feel feet like feel like they're glued, right? You can't uh, uh, you can't quite you can't quite make the move because your brain's yeah. not allowing. It's not. I don't think so, buddy. I don't know. This ain't going to work. Like it. Yeah. I would take somebody like that and have them step up onto the box and jump off of it. And do yeah. that maybe five or six times. And the the education that's gained from the distance and force that's applied, whether it be, yeah. a, a, you know, absorbing the shock or creating the uh, impact force, you learn. And then next thing you know, you can do it. And, yeah. and I've, I've done this so many times, I can't even tell you. Where yeah. somebody got stuck and, they you know, they, they're glued to the floor, got them up on the, on the box, brought them back down, put them back up, got them back down. I had a guy that used to work for me. I don't know. You remember Bunny? Do you, do you ever? Yeah, yeah, you do. So there was uh, there was three brothers that used to work for me. They were CrossFit guys. Alex. His Same name was. Uh, oh God, his name's escaping now. This little guy, we, we called him Bunny because he could he could jump right. And I yep. had those those big. Um, uh, they weren't truck tires. They were like a, some military vehicle tires. Yep. in the back of my place. And when you stack them up, they went about six feet tall. And yeah. with a bit of a run, he could, he was only like, like, like your height, about five, six or so. He could jump up onto that stupid thing. Um, and the re the way he learned to do it was to get up on it and jump down, get up on it, and jump down to finally he, he found his mark and was able to do it. But yeah. anyway, what, what we're talking about is impact forces and the way the body absorbs impact forces. And yep. it isn't about cushion. If you're looking for cushion, it won't work. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's stealing something from every, every time you take a step, but also just the way your body produces force to begin with. I mean, force applied equals velocity through space, right? Like right. biomechanics one one says what we're trying to do is create more power and force and then apply it. Right. So if you're taking that away and then giving it back in a different way, or you say you are, it's yeah, it's the waste of time. Well, I, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm absolutely convicted that there's no good that comes from putting all that cushion underneath your foot. And yeah. it hurts my heart when I see people that are educated that sell their soul to, you know, bang the drum for some corrupt product like that and, and put it out there. I don't know. Richard, I got to tell you, I was in a, a lab, a Nike scenario in um, Chicago, and there was a 
uh, biomechanics. I think he, yeah, he was a bio, he's a biomechanics expert for Nike. And he was basically saying that they have no proof, scientific proof that running or any specific thing in running causes any injuries. So they're basically saying like, we don't know that running causes injuries and we don't know how and what or why it does. So we can't make a shoe really that keeps us from getting injured. And I was just sort of like, man, Richard would love this one. <laughs> Cause it's like, these well, are the but, people that tend to be their, their experts, you know, and, I, I can yeah. assure you that it's kinematics. If you if you keep getting injured, there's something that you're doing wrong because your body's designed to do this. It's 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 yeah. appropriately designed to to move through space efficiently. And yeah. if you're inefficient in your action, you will find injury. And yeah. I, I, I just chase it down. Somebody comes to me, I have people do it all the time. You probably do it too. They they call you on the phone and they tell you what hurts. And I can already start drawing the picture. I can almost yep. start looking at what they're doing wrong that would cause that type of injury. Yeah. I, I don't even, almost 90% of the time, I don't even really need to see it. I mean, I do yep. see it, but in my mind, I'm like, I know what it is. And they're like, really? Yep. You know, how could you, I said, because I've seen this, I've seen this it's many, right. many times before. And you're showing me, you're telling me your complaints are very similar to other people that s suffer the same consequences. Yeah. So anyway, so at the end of the day, take the shoes off. I, I think if you're not going to, like you've said, you're not a proponent of, you're not, you're not selling just barefoot running necessarily, but I think even just training some of the time barefoot on the right surface is good. And then and I, I think just getting yeah. the shoe out of your way as much as you can. I think. Well, by the way, away. so let me be clear. I do recommend to clients that they do run barefoot on occasion yeah. uh, and, you know, obviously an appropriate surface is like, I mean, in my training programs, I, you know, I, I point out, look, I want you to walk the area that you're going to run in to make sure yeah. there's nothing there that's going to hurt you. Right. Yeah. And when you're pretty confident that the space you're going to run in is clear, then, yeah, I'd like, you know, I've had guys, I had a guy with uh, actually more than one, but I had this one guy in particular that comes to mind. He would, uh, he had the worst case of plantar fasciitis. It was just not going to go away. And I'm going to tell you when that gets on you, you know, it's it's a bear to get rid of, right? Yeah. And this guy was really, really hurting, you know, and uh, his girlfriend actually was training with him. I was training, I was coaching them both. She was doing really, really well. He was doing really, really poorly. He couldn't run. And I said, look, when she's running on the track, I want you to take your shoes off and run on the, on the grass in the field. And he did. And I asked him, I said, so when you're running barefoot on the grass, does it hurt? He said, no. I said, so it doesn't hurt when you take your shoes off and you're running on the grass. He goes, nope, it doesn't. I said, all right. Um, so that's what you're going to do for a while. It got cold, right? So he wasn't going to go out there in the cold and the barefoot. So he started running on his treadmill at home barefoot. Mm. And he put in a lot of time on the treadmill barefoot. And I think almost a year transpired. And this, but by this time, he's no longer hurt. He calls me and says he wants to come see me because he wants to do a gait evaluation. I said, great. He goes, do you mind if I take my shoes off? Mind you, the guy flew from from uh, uh, San Antonio, Texas to L.A. to see me. And he says, can I take my shoes off? I said, well, I assume we're going to get up to some pretty good speed. You sure you want to do that? He goes, oh, no, I do it all the time. And I didn't even know. He didn't. He never told me that. And he got on the treadmill and was running like a deer barefoot, right? And yep. so I videoed it. And I now I got really curious. I said, so let's let's see what happens when you put your shoes on. And I videoed him with his shoes on, with his shoes off. And there was carryover. So when he put the shoes on after running barefoot, he actually ran pretty well in his shoes. He goes, well, I only yep. wear my shoes when I race or when I'm outside. He goes, I don't generally wear, you know, all my training indoors is, is barefoot. Yeah. And supplemental, it's been great. So can I tell you, when I have people that are suffering from issues like that, I take the shoes off them. Yeah. And, and I usually, you know, as, as you know, I rock tape, I'm wearing this. I, I get involved in with some homeopathic treatments, I should call them. And mm -hmm. we, we, we do a good job with that, too. But at the end of the day, um, the quick fix is just get the shoes off. And, yeah. And stay barefoot as much as you can. Your kids are probably barefoot all the time, aren't they? All the time. And I, it, like, if people want to see proof of this, Dr. Mark Kukazella, yeah. right? Yeah. He's a Air Force Reserve Lieutenant Colonel. 
um, but just like a movement maniac. He's, I think he has like 10 sub 230 marathons, a lot like myself, except he has a lot of the barefoot stuff. And he's got amazing video online of different paces on regular paved road running, you know, sub six down, I think 530, 515 pace barefoot. And you're, you watch it and you're like, oh, yeah, that looks totally natural. And he looks, so, yeah. he, his running form is impeccable. He runs perfectly. And, you know, he spends, like you say, he spends a lot of time barefoot. And he owns yeah. a running shoe shop, right? So um, yeah, that, uh, what is it called, Twin Rivers or something like that? Yeah, it's um, West Virginia, I think. Somewhere, somewhere on the East Coast. I forget where. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I did an inter- I did a podcast with him. I, I, I know. Yeah. Um, been doing and, it a long time, you know? Yeah, well, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not here saying, hey, everybody take your shoes off and run barefoot. Um, because your pink little feet won't like it. You, you're, <laughs> you need to condition yourself. I'm barefoot. Yeah. As we speak, I'm sitting here barefoot. I I wear, here. Yeah, I wear shoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wear shoes when I leave the house. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm home, I don't have shoes on. Uh, I grew up in a flip-flop culture, and, like, I will do trail hikes, runs, run. I mean, I'm always in flip-flops, and, you know, it's my feet are strong, and, yeah, I do a lot of beach runs too on the on the sand, um, all barefoot. So, and I have for, I mean, for twenty years. So, yeah. At the end of the day, uh, I think we got our message across. I'm really curious to see if anybody has any feedback. Uh, I could take it if they're criti- they want to be critical. Um, right. Don't blame Blue. It's all my my fault. And uh, <laughs> Blue is pleasure seeing you. Uh, very you. very excited for you. Got another kid on the way. Three boys. That's man. crazy. <laughs> yeah. You know, you need to get a farm. I know, man. Gotta get, get one of them to going. milk the cow, the other one to feed the chickens, and the other one to plow the field. 